Ruchem Avoyim B'Shem Irgin Shir Teremos is Boston. I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's Shir. Everyone who's Matriach to come in person, even though it was raining. The women that are Snoshem and all the people who are joining in through the phone and online. Ruchem Avoyim. Back to the Big Shikach to Mr. and Mrs. Hashi Oberlander for the support for tonight's Shir. Ruchem Nishmas, Saisha Malka, Basar of Avrom, Anshala Koyen. Well, Shalom, so I was today, Chov Zayin Ov, Tenish Moses, Shura B'Tzor HaChayim. Rabbi Yisai, you can have the great schus of Avot Zetar Deravim worldwide by supporting and sponsoring one of Yigen Shutar Shiurim, or putting an ad in the journal in an upcoming dinner event whose paperwork you've seen around the shul or it's on the table near the door. Perfect opportunity to honor one of the Rabbanim who Shiurim you've enjoyed by putting in an ad. We're giving a generous donation of Achzaka Satar and Abbas Satar Darabim by calling Irgin Shiri Tyra at 718-851-8651 or email tapecenter at yeshivanet.com. Tonight we have the cover to have with us once again Rabbi Shol Shimon Deutsch, street founder of the Living Torah Museum, Rav Liazna, on bringing ancient Jewish life and Torah Judaism alive. So my cover to call Rabbi Deutsch for tonight's year. It's a covered goddle to speak to you tonight. This year has been a difficult one for many, many people. And Chazde Hashem, I myself went through a very difficult time with uh, this corona. But as I was lying in bed, a new idea came to my mind, which I'm going to present for the first time tonight. And this is a revolutionary idea. Maybe in the times in which we are living, this is something that would be a tremendous, tremendous thing. Let me begin, for those people who don't know anything about the Living Torah Museum, 19 years ago, I, with the encouragement of many Gedele Yisrael, including Rabbi Yisrael Belsky, I founded the Living Torah Museum, which was made with the sole purpose of helping people understand difficult things that you need to understand only through visualization, through seeing it. We're now in a very complicated part of Daf Yoimi where we deal with various different movois and various different houses. I can tell you that most of them I have seen bechush in various different archaeological sites how the houses were set up, and some of them are Negea even to yesterday's daf. Seeing things bechush, what it does is it clarifies in a tremendous way a lot of the things we learn. So our museum, people always ask me, what do you focus on? I said, I focus on Torah. What does that mean? It means if it means showing ancient artifacts, how things looked in the time of Chazal, I'm going to show that. If it means showing you what the animals of the Torah look like, when we learned in the parsha last week, Akoy Dishan Tzvi Ayel Yachmer and Zomer, and people go through these very quickly and have no idea what an Akoy is, what a Dishan is, what a Ayol is. Correcting mistakes that people make. People walk around thinking a Nesher is an eagle. And Toysus and Chulun Daf Samach Gimel Amud Alef Divra Maskel Hanet says Toes Gedayla, Ma Shekoyin LeNesher Eagle. It's a totally different bird. The only one who says the Nesher's Eagle is the Chuskuni. He's a Das Yachid. Most of Farshim don't learn that. Correcting mistakes where people walk around thinking that Tzvi is a deer. And Rashi and Chulun says on the very interesting sugya that talk that talks about different horns. And Rashi says, And Rashi says, What we call a tzvi is not the tzvi the chazal we're talking about. So I spent years trying to help correct a lot of these fallacies and mistakes that people make when they're learning. And the museum also focuses on many different things that help understand what things were like. Before Abelski was Nifter, he gave me 17 projects that he wanted me to do. Make whips, so people are learning Masechtas Makas should see what a whip looks like, 
I have a whole shear, one hour showing you how to give malchus. I've had people come over to me and say, you know, could you try it on me? And, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to get malchus. I, I don't do that. But to see what does it mean, how the skin of the, the, the skins are intertwined with each other. Uh, you can come to my museum after Corona and see exactly what the whips look like. Unfortunately, our great governor has said that museums are very, very dangerous places. So we thought we're going to be able to open up our museum in stage four. And we asked the governor why bars were allowed to open in stage two. But museums are not allowed to open in stage four. He said museums are very dangerous places. And the mayor agrees with him. So this summer, our museum in the Catskills is closed. Our museum in Borough Park is closed. The only thing I'm allowed to do is go to different places and give shiur. But my place, I can't open up. It's a, a mamish, unbelievable, open anti-Semitism. I don't care if it's being broadcast around the world. The governor is an anti-Semite. The mayor is an anti-Semite. I say it very clearly. I have no problem. Chutzpah. People could march... People could do every shtus in the world. Everything is good. But a museum is not allowed to open. Now, after Rishchidosh, after they know that Rishchidosh, everyone goes back to you, say, oh, museums can open right after Rishchidosh. The chutzpah is unbelievable. But I, those who know me, know my history, I'm not a person who shies away from saying what I think and I say what I feel. You like it? Fine. You don't like it? Don't be macabre. It's fine with me as well. So, you know, every time there's a xera, we have to take something away and say, we can't just go back to do what we've did till now. We have to do more. And tonight, I have a very, very revolutionary concept to represent to you what we can do that has never, ever been done in the history of Kalal Yisrael. And I'm going to begin by telling you a story that happened with Rabbi Yisrael Belsky. Rabbi Belsky, the museum was his terror playground. He was a person who constantly would call me and tell me we should do this project and that project and this thing and that thing. And one night, at 10.15 at night, Rabbi Belsky, and this is in his biography. I, I told the story to Art School, they put it into the biography. One night at 10.15 at night, Rabelsky calls me up and he says to me, I heard that the smallest kosher sefer in the world is being sold at an auction. I want you to buy it for the Living Torah Museum. So I said to Rabelsky, why do you want me to buy it? He said, I'll tell you, if you get the Torah, I'm coming to give a special share. The kids, so we spoke to his sponsors, whatever. Soft, cool, soft. I'm not going to get into the whole story. I got a phone call. Go pick up the Sefer Torah. I went, I picked up the Sefer Torah. And it was a tremendous simcha to go pick up such a Sefer Torah. I called Rebelsky. I said, I'm on the way to pick up the Sefer Torah. And he says, when are you going to be back in Brooklyn? I said, oh, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. I said, very good. He hangs up the phone. I'm coming back to Borough Park, and I'm driving on 16th Avenue by Day Hill, and I see traffic. I don't know why to get to the 16th and 41st where we're located. There's so much traffic. So I roll down the window, and I ask somebody, what's going on? He said, you didn't hear? I said, what? He said, the smallest tire in the world is coming to the Living Tire Museum. I said, really? Baruch Hashem. The person didn't know what I looked like. So I parked my car far away. And I bring the Torah, and the Mishpring, and people are all excited. This teeny tiny Torah is now coming to the museum. We bring it up to the museum, and Rabelsky stands up and he gives a shear. He said, why did I want this Torah to come here? A Melech Yisrael had to wear tefillin on his left hand. On his right hand, he had to wear a Sefer Torah. Shivisi Hashem l'negdi samid ki mi yamina. From the words ki mi yamina, we learn, a melech has to wear a Torah. A king has so much power, it's very, very easy for him to forget the Rabbani Shalom. How does he constantly remember the Rabbani Shalom? He wears a Torah. So the Rambam in Hilchus Malachim, 
when he wrote the halacha that a melech has to wear a sefer he didn't say how to strap it. The, the, the Bryce and Sanhedrin says, you roll up your sleeve, you put on the Sefer Torah in a leather bag, you take off the Yitzchayim's two straps, and you strap it to your right arm. The Rambam did not write this in his halacha. Frag the Radvaz, why didn't the Rambam include how to wear the Sefer Torah? So the Radvaz writes two words. Rachoiku. It's a far-fetched idea you can write. It's a how far away idea that you can write a Torah so small. Rabelsky rolls up his sleeve and he takes this two-inch Sefer Torah that has writing of 1.75 inches. And he rolls up his sleeve and shows that it fits on his muscle of his arm. Schottenstein Sefer Torah, which is the second smallest Sefer Torah in the world, is a little too big. It's two, two and a half inches. This is two inches. Uh, so unless you're a person who has massive muscles that can do that, for most people, that's not going to happen. I brought you tonight to see the smallest kosher Sefer Torah in the world. We read from it every Shabbos by Mincha and my Medrash downstairs from the museum. From Shavuos until, uh, from, from uh, Labor Day until Shavuos, every Shabbos we read it by Mincha. So if you happen to be in Bar Park and you want to get an Aliyah, maybe even Hagba from the Sefer Torah, you can come down to my shul. So I'd like to show you if everyone could please stand up. This is the smallest kosher Sefer Torah in the world. And, not only that, I opened it to Vayikra El Moshe. So you should see the small aleph of Vayikra, the smallest letter of the smallest kosher Sefer Torah in the world. Oh, we have a Balkaira. His name is Meir Barowitz. He reads from it every Shabbos. He has very good eyesight. And actually, if you take off your glasses, it's very clear. I'll just walk away from the stage for a second to show you how clear it is. How was it written? Okay, so let me go back to the stage. So this here is the smallest kosher Sefer Torah in the world. Now, anyone who learns Lamites Malachis knows that if you write two Oiseus, you are over in the Malacha of Ksiva. So I wanted to show you the teeniest, tiniest Sefer Torah in the world and the smallest letter of the smallest kosher Sefer Torah in the world. And this is mamish, in order to be able to see, I want to hold it up for the camera so everyone can see. You know what, so I'm going to walk back to the camera. I'll walk. You want me to hold it here or go further back? Come over here, hold on. Okay, let's let's go further. Okay, it's no problem. The three lines on the bottom right here are the Vayikra El Moshe, and at the end of the word Vayikra is the smallest letter of the smallest tire in the world. That's Kasha. I want to show you what Rabelsky did. He, t he showed that if you take your muscle, the Sefer Torah fits on the muscle of your arm. So if you would take off the eight times and you would actually put it into a leather bag with two straps, this is how a Melech Yisrael used to wear the Torah. And this is what the Radvaz and the Rambam could not understand how you could write a Torah so small. I'm giving a shir two years ago, Hanukkah. 
And an eight-year-old boy asked me the most fascinating question. He said to me, Rabbi Deutsch, yeah, no, yeah, I'm going to put it away. Yeah, let's put it away. Say, if a tire like this is $150,000. So he wrote it under a magnifying glass. He's a brisket cipher. You need brisket patience to do something like this. And uh, he wrote it. An eight-year-old boy, Hanukkah, two years ago, asked me the most fascinating question. He said, Rabbi Deutsch? I said, yes. He said, Mashiach is a malach. So when Mashiach comes, are you going to give Mashiach this Torah? Good question, right? I told him no. He said, why? I said, because the Sefer Torah of a Melech has to be written L'Shem the Melech. This one was written for Kriya Satara. The second reason is that a Sefer Torah has to be written on Gvil of a Melech. This was written on Klav. So let me take a moment to explain to you what's Gvil and what's Klav. An animal, when you take off the skin of a kosher animal, after you shecht it, you take off the skin, if you shave off all the hair and you preserve that side where the hair used to be, that is called gvil. The Sefer Torah of Amel has to be written on gvil. But gvil is very thick. So what do they do? When they make cloth, what they do is they take the whole skin, they take a razor blade, cut it halfway. One side is called duch sustus, and one side is called klaf. So klaf is half of the thickness of gvil. And it could be that this was the kasha of the Rambam. And the kasha of the Radvaz, how do you write a Sefer Torah on gvil? Because it's very thick. So, I'm going to announce tonight that I've thought long and hard about it, and I'm working now to do something that's never been done before. The Chafetz Chaim had clothing ready for Mashiach. People did all kinds of things to show their Tonight, I'm happy to tell you, we are starting to write a Sefer Torah for Mashiach Tzitkenu. We're going to leave the last Pasuk not written. It's going to be on Gvil, because the halacha is that uh, if you finish the last Pasuk, it's your Torah. You could have it to be your Torah. It's going to be written on Gvil. It's going to be small enough to fit onto your arm. Yes. I'm going to be Machna if Mashiach comes and I'm Zoyche to be here to do it. I will hand Mashiach Tzitkenu. The Sefer Torah. This is something that's never been done. And I thought about Corona. And I thought about, we have to do things that have never been done before. Because just going back to what we did is not enough. Maybe our Gullus, we've become too comfortable in our Gullus. Maybe we're too comfortable. And the Abishta wanted to wake us up. So it's not only preparing clothes for Mashiach. We're going to prepare a Sefer Torah written on Gvil for Mashiach Tzitkenu. And anyone who wants to be Mishtatif in this tremendous thing, it's something that's never been done, could contact me, Be'ezus Hashem, in the next few days. It's something that Be'ezus Hashem, Yeshua Hashem, is Geher, if I am Mashiach, could come in one minute. And you will be standing there with me to present this very unique Sefer Torah, which a Melech HaMashiach is required to have. Again, I'm not getting in. You know, I was the biggest fighter against uh, Antem Meshachist with uh, Chabad. Uh, that's not at all the intention here. Anyone who knows my history knows how I lived in a house with bulletproof windows because of my fight against the Meshachism that took place. But this is not that. This is the real McCoy. This is the real halacha of a melech. And this Shiloh that an eight-year-old boy asked me is what inspired me 
to say, Taka, why don't we prepare a Sefer Torah, which Mashiach is required to have, and then we could know that we Taka did something Mamash's dick in preparation for Mashiach. You worried about which Ksav is going to be? These things, I, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I would stomach it's going to be Ari, probably, but I'm not going to start making a machloikis about that. In other words, if somebody comes to me and says, I want to pay for this, lock, stock, and barrel, I'm paying for whatever cost the Savior Torah is, whatever Ksav he wants, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. Very simple. I'm not going to get into all of those uh, things. I, I'm doing this to be meachet kol Yisrael, not to chas v'shalom bring period all of us. But it's something that is required, la'alacha. It's something that's never been done. And it's something that we can do even in the, in the matzav that we stand now. We can do something that's something that's truly unique. Another project I've been working very hard this summer is to inspire every person to learn and to know what the Tayag Mitzvah Sater are. People go through their whole lives, they know zero of what the Tayag Mitzvahs are. So I made a contest. I went around to a lot of camps this summer. I said, I'm giving away a $1,000 prize to any boy who can tell me the Tayag Mitzvah Sater. I was in Dairyland camp for Satmer. A boy, a young boy before Bar Mitzvah, rattled off to me the Tayag Mitzvah Satir. I asked this boy, how did you know it? He told me during Corona he was sitting at home. He didn't have a yeshiva, he didn't have anywhere to go. So he took Osei for Achinuch and he learned it. I wanted to show people what it means before Bar Mitzvah, boys can rattle off Tayag Mitzvah Satur. People question this thing and that thing. You're going to come with the Bezn and they're going to say to you, you came here with Talmud and Biyoda. They're going to ask you, what are the Tayag Mitzvah Satur? You spent 70, 80, 90 years on this world and you never bothered once to learn the Tayag Mitzvah Satur. What kind of busha? What kind of busha is that? People have to learn the fundamentals of Yediya Satir. The Rav Shulchan Aruch writes in Hilchos Talmud Torah, a neshama has to come back again and again to this world until he finishes the entire Chavdalet Svarim of Torah Nevi'im Ksuvim in Pirushao V'diktukel. And April a person learns Torah, it cannot be seven yeshiva shemesechtes. It cannot be that we only focus on a very, very limited scope. Our scope and our opportunity that we are given has to be expanded according to our capabilities and learn in a different way. One of my favorite things I have is a copy of the Pincus Ha'ir from the city of Volozhin. Many years ago I was in Russia and I made the copy in a library in Russia who has the Pincus Ha'ir of the city of Volozhin. In the city of Volozhin's Pincus, it has many of the Takonis as a section on the yeshiva, and then it has a list of all the svarim that they have. And unfortunately, next to a lot of svarim, it says nignav, nignav, nignav. Sefer was stolen. Who was the biggest yachsen in Europe? It was the gabai who had the keys to the shul. Right? We have a gabai here who has keys to a shul. So a gabai who has keys to a shul was the biggest yachsen in Europe. Why? He had access to Svarim. Many G'dayli Yisrael never saw a lot of Svarim that you and I take up as considered regular Svarim. When the Balatanya was arrested 
in his file, there's a section that asked him, which svarim have you seen? So many svarim he never saw. I had a story with the Lubavitcher Rebbe Zatzal once. He was by a Fabrengan, he was making a seum on a certain Masechta. He was starting Masechta Shabbos. And the Rebbe asked the Kasha. The Rebbe said, I never saw a Sefer should ask this Kasha. For me, it was a Pella, the Shabbos Shalmi asked this Kasha. Every Yeshiva Bacha learned Shabbos Shalmi. So after Shabbos, I sat down, I wrote a letter to the Rebbe. I said, the Rebbe, here's a copy of the Shabbos Shalmi. The Rebbe wrote me back, Here's part of the world in Russia where he was there. He never saw the Shabbos Shalmi. Today, by the push of a button, you have 50,000 svarim and 90,000 svarim, and who knows how many things you can make searches, you can make things. We have access today for learning that if the daily Israel of previous generations got up right now and saw the svarim shafa in this shul, they would be dancing from Simcha. So we buy svarim, and people buy and buy swarm. The question is, do you learn them? The question is, how much time are you learning them? So we need to make fundamental changes. Fundamental changes means every person needs to know the Tayag Mitzvah Satayah. You want to go to Rambam, you want to go to Chinuch, whatever you want. Every kid should be learning all of these things. Because when you're young and you learn it, it comes into the person's head. So I want to show you now a murder of Mishnah. And then, this is a tremendous Mishnah that talks, Mesach Kinin, the Mishnah says, when the isle was alive, when the ram was alive, it made kerlachas. One sound. When you makriv the isle, Avram Avinu took every part of the isle, and he made something kedusha. From the horns he made shoifers. From the bones of the legs, he made chalilin. What did he do with the skin of the animal? He made drums. These are two drums from the Cherokee Indians from 150 years ago in America. And I brought, I'm going to show you two interesting things. This, dr this drum is made from the skin of a ram. Just like the Mishnah says about Avraham Avinu. And this over here is an uh, Indian drum. And this is what the Mishnah and Kinnim is talking about. Now in this case here, they smoothed out and took off all the hair of the drum. But since people learned Afyoimi, I'm now going to show you an amazing other drum. That's Nagea to when you learned Mesech to Shabbos. We're now in Erevin, but we're learning Shabbos. This drum here is with the original hair of the ram. They shaved off part of the hair on this part. You still can see the little holes where the follicles of the hair once were. And when you're learning about in Shabbos about smoothing out the skin from the holes of the follicles, this is what the Mishnah and the Gemara in Shabbos is actually referring to. At the end, you can all look at it. You can see these little follicles, the little holes where the follicles of the hair used to go on the drum. Here, the hair is still here. Right over here, you can see the holes and how in the ancient world, they used to actually, they didn't do it here, they used to smooth it out, as you saw on the other drum. Let me show you another important Mishnah. The Mishnah talks about something, if you, if you say Bamem Madlikim on Friday night, you would say it every week. If you don't say Bamem Madlikim and you learn the Perik, you're going to see this Mishnah. La yikoiv adam shefera shel beah v'yamalen shemen. Don't make a hole in an egg and use it as a reserve tank for your oil lamp. 
I was one of these kids who used to ask too many questions in class. My rabbis used to kick me out three to four times a week for asking too many questions. So I'm sitting in class, I'm trying to imagine how do you make holes in eggs? So that day, I came home from yeshiva, and my mother had come home from the grocery. So I told her, I'll unpack the entire order as long as everybody gets out of the kitchen. I went to her sewing box and I took out a couple of needles and I cracked a half a dozen eggs, trying to make a hole in the eggs. And she asked me, what am I doing? It's Baltashchis. And I told her, no, it's Limadatayr. So I went around to Gedailim. I said, Vasada dipshat in the Mishnah. And I didn't get clear answers. And finally, a major discovery was made. And I'm going to show it to you. A lot of the antiques that come to our museum were things that were found in the Mediterranean Sea. Yama Tichon. Now, the law of the world is the first nine miles next to a country, anything found in those waters, the Eretz Yisrael belongs to the Shut HaTikot, the Israeli Antiquities Authority. After nine miles, it's international waters. So what scuba diving teams who are salvage divers, what they do is they go out in the middle of the, the Mediterranean looking for shipwreck items. And we buy a lot of these kind of items. I'm going to show you a sample of what some of them look like. This is a Kaylee that was found three weeks before Corona came to the United States. It's a Kaylee, a Klicheris, a pottery vessel. You can see the pottery right here. But it's covered with coral. In Mishnayis, coral is called Almoig. Almoigim, the bartender says, Shikari noisy coral. So this is completely uncleaned. Now, how do you know how old something like this is? What you're going to do is going to look for the coins that people were using at that time. I'd like to show you a real treasure. A piece of coral with 200 coins stuck together. Uncleaned, as it was discovered right before Corona. This piece right here. We took two of the coins and cleaned them. They're from the time of Hadrayanus, means it's the time of Rabbi Akiva. So we haven't yet cleaned these. But this is what we're going to find in the sea. Now, people always traveled with money. So if they traveled with money, they're going to find coins from that king. Every melech only minted king, coins during his lifetime. Once a melech died, it was illegal to use his coins. The Gemara calls it dinner shenifsala. It became puzzle. Oisha nimchak, either it got rubbed out, or you made a hole in the coin, or the king died. That's the way a coin will become puzzle. Let me use an example that everyone will have a good laugh. If you made coins of Donald Trump, and you made a hole right through Donald Trump's nose on the coin, and Donald Trump would see that coin, I guarantee you he would be very upset. Right? You, you see his personality, you know that Donald Trump will be upset to see on the hole right through his nose. So the Gemara says if you made a hole in the Matbeya of a king, it's considered Pchisas HaKovet. The king died, in England by the way, this is still today. When King George died, Buckingham Palace put up a notice Everybody, turn in your old coins. We'll give you new coins of the new queen. So you gave in your old coins. They made new coins, and that's what they gave you. So if you find a shipwreck, you're going to know exactly how old it is based on the coins that are found. So this is what it looks like uncleaned as it was discovered. So most of the items we will clean. We always leave a few things not clean to show you what it looks like. To show you now an ostrich egg with all the white coral still on it.
that was discovered with an oil lamp. This oil lamp, the guy who made it actually signed his name on the bottom in Greek. And we know that when you made a Kaylee, Wendy is the Gemara Asi of the Kaylee. When you sign, it's like an artist signing a picture. Now he's satisfied with the picture. The oil went at the center. Four psilis, four holes, went on the four sides. Ostrich eggs are very hard. The Negev was full of ostriches. Basayana in the Torah. What did they used to do? This can hold six hours of oil. You want to learn for 12 hours. They took an ostrich egg, made a hole at the center. Little holes here, they put it like a stopper here. Flipped it over onto your oil lamp. So now instead of six hours of oil, you had 12 hours of learning light. Rabbi Yehuda says, if you machaber together, so you don't take out any oil during Shabbos, because maybe he's going to make the light of the oil lamps go out, then you're allowed to do it. The mile of the egg of an ostrich, it's very hard. I'm going to take an egg from an ostrich from our times. Egg from an ostrich from our times. Could you come here for a second? Yeah. Do you like to punch? Come here. What I want you to do right now is punch this egg. Come here. As hard as you can. Go on, punch. Your, ha your hand hurt you a little bit? Not yet? A little harder. Ah, oh, now he hit me. Okay, now you're going to have a seat. <laughs> so the Mishnah, Mesachtis Kalim, says, you can use the baits of Shel Namis, the egg of an ostrich, as a keli. The Gemara in Chulun says, Minayin, for how do you know that you're not allowed to eat a beitza? Shel Oif Tomei, Shenemar, it says in the Pasuk, Ves Bas Hayana, the daughter of an ostrich. Frag the Gemara of Chiyash Bas An ostrich has, an, a daughter has an egg. We just learned in Parshish uh, Re'e, Shabbos, Bas Hayana. So the Gemara learns out from this in Chulin that you're not allowed to eat a Beit Shalif Tama, but you're allowed to use it as a Kaili. In the base Hamigdash, you were allowed to use ostrich eggs. Anybody know for what? No? In Mesech Tispara, it says that the Beit from a Namis and the Rambam Paskins in Lacha. The egg of an ostrich, you can take the mechatos. They took the afer of the paraduma. They added water to it. And that's how they used to sprinkle you. Oh, Mashiach is going to come. We have to go through the afer of the paraduma. So you guys are going to prepare yourself for Mashiach to know that you can actually use ostrich eggs. How did they empty? They had a special tool. I have it in the museum that they used to use to make holes. Simmin Toiva, Mazel Toiva. Stand and punch and play music for you if you want. Now, once every 1,000 kids, someone's going to bust this, uh, uh, the ostrich egg. Okay, so we get another one. I'm friends with a guy who's an ostrich farmer, so I get some more ostrich eggs. But this is called the Living Torah Museum because you learn it, you can see the Mitzvahs. I'm going to show you now two swords. One that has been completely cleaned, and one that the coral is still on the sword, on the handle. This is called a cherev pefiois. Every day in Davni, you talk about a cherev pefiois biodam. The blade is sharp on both sides. This is a cherev pefiois. Now, this sword was considered very dangerous. Cherpefius, you could kill, and it's still a little sharp, just as we found it. I want to show you a Rashi that most people learn and don't understand what Rashi is saying. If you take your finger and put it right here in the back of your neck, this is called your Oyrif. Am Kishay Oyrif, talking about the back of your neck. 
your throat is called the garring. The tzavar is the bump in your neck that you have in the front. Okay? What does Rashi say happened to Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe Rabbeinu kills the Mitzri. Parai sends his executioner to kill Moshe. What happens to the executioner? He takes Moshe's head, he flips it back, exposing the tzavar. He takes a sword and puts it right down on the tzavar. This piece becomes like shayish, like marble, and kills the executioner because it bounces off and kills the executioner. Moshe runs away. You learn Masech Tzbrachis, we learn a person always has to dive into Hashem. Could you, can I borrow you here for a second? You okay? You sure? Anybody want to volunteer? Because I'll show you. Oh, very good. Come on. I'm not going to kill you. Don't worry about it. Come over here. Just to show what it means, you would expose the neck like this. I guarantee you this boy is never going to forget again what the Gemara is actually talking about. <laughs> That's the pshat. You daven every day, we say, Vahar Eneinu Besarasecha. The Torah is in front of us. We have to understand it. In order to understand Torah, Rav left the Beis Medrash and went to live on a farm for 18 months. Rav! Only to learn the, uh, the anatomy of an animal and know what was considered the defects that made something into a trifle. Rav went to live on a farm for 18 months. The Gemara in Chulin tells us what happens if an animal has a split or is missing a piece by the gargaris. Gargaris is the trachea. If you don't know what a trachea is, visit a hospital, look at someone who smoked a lot of cigarettes and they install into his throat a trachea. That's, the behemoth has a trachea as well. That's the gargaris. Zogdi Mishnah, if the hole in the gargaris is till the size of a Yisra Italki, the behemoth could live a year. If it's me Yisra Italki or Lamaila, the behemoth is a trifle. Frag the Gemara, in our time, which coin do we have that's the size of Yisra Italki? What's the Gemara asking? You have to know the history to understand this Gemara. When Rome fell, the tribes that took over Rome, the empire was called the Sasanian Empire. Shvor Malka, Isgader Malka, Peruz, these are all Sasanian kings. They did not allow you to use anymore the Roman coins. The Roman had a coin called the Yisra Italki. So the Gemara Shaila now is what coin do we have today that's the same size of Yisra Italki? So the Gemara says there's a place called Kurdinoi. We call it today Kurdistan. As Rashi writes, Kurdu. And in Kurdistan, they had a coin that was exactly those who don't know where Kurdistan was, northern Iran, Iraq, and Turkey used to be its own country. You hear the Kurds on the news always fighting for their independence. Those were the Kurdim, these were the Kurds. If you look in Onkelos, the Hare Ararat, where did the Teva rest? Turu de Kurdu, the mountains of Kurdistan. So they had a coin that was the same size of an Isra Talki. What does the Gemara say? Rabbi Yechelen left the base Medrash, and he went to go and measure this coin. There was an Amor in the Gemara, his name was Rabchana Psoiroi, Rabchana the money changer. He had a table that used to change money for you. And Rabbi Yochanan went to his table and he picked up this coin to see what the Isra Italki was. This coin is a Yisra Italki. It's between a quarter and a half a dollar. 
Rabbi Yochanan left the base Medish to measure that coin of Kordanoi, which was the size of a Yisra How do you know what this is? Because each one has the denominations. It's like you have dime, penny, quarter, same thing. So this is an Yisra Italki. Imagine, Rab went to live on a farm for 18 months to learn mumim. Rabbi Yechelen left the Beis Medrash to go see what a Yisra Italki is. So he goes to Rabbi Chana's table, he picks up the coin, and Rabbi Chana wants to stand up for Rabbi Yechelen. Zakti Gemara, Rabbi Yechelen motioned to him, don't stand up for me. The Gemara now starts a shakl of Italia. Why didn't Rabbi Yechelen want him to show him covet? Covered at Tyra. The Gemara says he was a schir yaim. He was a day laborer. He's now going to be mafsik in the middle of the day. Frag the Gemara, what about Bikurim? Bikurim is a mitzvah that even at the schir yaim is allowed to be mafsik. The Gemara says Bikurim is a tircha gedayla. So we give a special thing to encourage people to bring Bikurim. The whole shakl of Italian, the Gemara is... Why Rabbi Yochanan didn't want Rabbi Chana to stand up for him? What was Rabbi Yochanan doing in a tray from the Roman marketplace? Only to know what is the size of an Isser HaItalki. One of the first things Rabbi Yashiv asked me to show him was, what does Kereich of Isser HaItalki mean? A Esser that's missing until the size of Isser HaItalki. Mazen Shtei Sud is coming up in Erevin. What's the smallest pass in Halacha Kerecha Visir Italki? So this here is a fundamental coin that you can't learn Shas without knowing what's Kerecha Visir Italki. Today you can buy from the Living Torah Museum seven original coins from 2,000 years ago that we find for $580. You have a set of a dinner, a ma, a punjan, a isaratalki, a musmus, kuntrik, and a pruta, kedushin, a fidbezam, and aleph. Any sugi and shas you're going to learn, in five minutes you can see every size of every coin, and it's coming now up in Erevin. Rabbi Yashav was so fond of antiques. Rabbi Yashav once asked me if I knew a certain shear. There's a shear in Chazal called the shear of a litra. Lamed Yud Tes Reish. Where's the litra in Negea? Avram Avinu gives his guests to eat. The person doesn't want to thank Hashem. He charged them for a litra shal basar. It was a measurement of weight for meat. A person, a Ben Sarah who steals from his parents. And he buys a tartimur shal basar. The Yerushalmi says a tartimur is a half a litra. A person's mevaza uh, Talmud Chacham, they gave him a knas of a litra shal zahav. person wants to make uh, Erev by Yerakos, he needs a litra shal Yerakos. So by pas, the small size of a pas is kiroichev isaritalki. But if you want to make an Erev by Yerakos, you need a literature Yerakos. So Biyashev asked me if I have in the museum a litra. I told him no. He says to me, it's Big Machlekes. If you take the safe of Midas of Shiyuri Atoyer from Chaim Benish, the big Machlekes. The Rambam thought a litra is 148.7 grams. Rashi thought it was 354. The Rif thought it was 420, 425. So Biyashev many times asked me if I knew what the share of a litra was. I didn't know. And every time I told him the same answer, I checked other museums, no one has a litra. The week of Rabbi Yashev's big surgery in the Mediterranean Sea, the scuba divers are in the water and they take out a weight made of lead. Now, if you remember 10th grade chemistry, gold, silver, and lead do not change in water even over time. They find a weight that says on that in Greek, litra. An L in Greek is an upside down V. An I looks like the American I. A T looks like the American T. An R is a P, like in Russian, a P is an R. An A, litra. We put it on a scale after it's cleaned, and it's exactly Rashi's share of 354 grams. 
I was so excited. I called to let Rabbi Yashiv know that we found the litra, but he was in surgery. So Arya Yashiv picked up the phone. We told him, Zagibit the Rav, as mit gifun in the litra. He said, the Rav is in the Beit Cholim in Anituach. I said, go to the hospital. When Rabbi Yashiv opens his eyes, let him know. Two days later, after Rabbi Yashiv heard there's a litra available, he wanted to see it. In my book, Ambracious, you could see a picture of Rabbi Yashiv with the litra. And he said to me, I'm telling you the story because we're learning Erevin now. I brought you tonight to see the only complete litter in the world. On it, upside down V, I T P A, litra. And it's exactly Rashi Shir of 354. There's some that have holes in it that's missing pieces. This is the only complete one. So this over here, so I was very excited. So Rabbi Asher said to me, So I said to Rabbi Asher, You would paskin with gifin in an antique? With finding an antique? He looks at me and he says, When I was going to say that I was going to film with Rashi and Rabbi Tam. In the Zeit from the Rif, they didn't know the say they are Parshas. They found film like Rashi, and that's how they paskened. We go by what we find. So when Rabbi Asher passed away, I was by Rabbi Chaim. Rabbi Chaim asked me to say over certain things that I heard from Rabbi Asher. When I told him this, he told me, says, I'm off in the Gemara. It's an open Gemara. The Gemara tells the story of one of the Amaroim, who was once told by a Yishmaeli, an Ishmaelite, that he saw the bones of the Mesa Hamidbar. And the Ishmaelite, the Ishmaeli, took him to see it. And this Ramayra wanted to take off a piece of clothing from this mess, this, this Mesim. And he became paralyzed, they couldn't move, and the Ishmaeli told him, the Gemara says, that you can't touch anything from them. If you take from them, you have to put it back or you can't move. And they put it back and, and he was okay. He came to the base Madrash. And he told the Chachamim what happened. Amru lai Chachamim. Why didn't you check the Chutim of the Tzitzis if they were like Beis Shammai or Beis Hillel? So Rabbi Chaim says to me, Oib di Gemara givolt machlitzan de machloikis from Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel. By the Chutim of Tzitzis. By gefinin the, the Mesei Hamidbar. Zichir kem in Paskin Amidan. So when I was by Rabbi Yashiv, so Rabbi Yashiv said to him, it's Negea, the Pasuk and the Shir for Na'erev, by Yerokos. So I said to Rabbi Yashiv, he said, Ben Sarah murders Lahoyle in Nivra, but this is Negea La'alacha. So I said to him, the price of that week of gold was $1,840 an ounce. So I said to him, Kum to Chois, as I mentioned, me vaza Talmud Chochem, you have to give a person who is mevazal tamachos a knas of fourteen and a half thousand dollars. Now, people who didn't know Rabbi Yashiv thought he didn't have a sense of humor. In Torah, he was very funny. He says to me, Today is tamid chachamim, and not the caliber of tamid chachamim. If not for this, I'd bring it back. And A person knew he's getting a knas for fourteen and a half thousand dollars. He would think twice about making up a pashkvil. I want to show you now a gemara. I'm going to have to finish already. I will end with a very important gemara that nobody knew shot in this gemara until this litter was found. And it has to do with Tisha B'Av. The Gemara says that how did Hashem punish Titus? A Yitush, a small fly, went into his nose. 
and started eating up Perez's brain. I'm holding in my hands a coin that the Greeks called Sela. Two of them are called Shnei Sloim. So the Gemara wants to know, that fly, how big was it when they opened Titus' head? So the Gemara says it was the size of a tzipur drar, like a songbird. I have songbirds in my museum, all different sizes, from a miniature to a huge one. Frag the Gemara, how big was this tzipur drar? The Gemara says a machloikis. Titus had a big headache, right? That fly had turned either the size of Kishnei Sloim, two of these, or Kishnei Litrim. For the first time, you can look at my hands and see a Gemara in Sanhedrin that people have been learning for 1,700 years. And you can see what Kishnei Sloim or Kishnei Litrim actually means. And that's why we call it the Living Torah Museum. Because the goal is to bring Torah to light that you should be able to learn and understand. Reb Chaim asked me to give out a Sefer on everything. I gave out so far Bereshis, Shmois, Vayikra, Bamidbar is about to go to press, Mulachim Aleph, Mulachim Beis. My goal is to give out on every Chumash, every Navi, every Mishnah and Gemara. So Reb Chaim told me, Medaf HaGem, of Yedda Sefer, so I told him I need a Rikhis Yamim. So Baruch Hashem, he benched me with a Rikhis Yamim. So during Corona, I, I knew I had a bracha for Reb Chaim. I have a project to make, which is to finish Kol HaTorah Kula, that people should be able to see it, understand it, and learn it. And the Ikel Limud of, of Mashiach is going to be that everything will become clear. Torah Sashem Mashiach, what's the Pshat? Torah Chadasha Me'iti Teitzah. Torah Chadasha means that the Torah is not going to change. Latiyah Mechlefes. But everything will come in a way that it's easy to understand. So I started this year by talking about the smallest Torah. I spoke about the fact, to summarize, uh, that we need to write now a new Sefer Torah for Kabbalah's Pnei Mashiach Tzedkenu that's written on not Klaf but Gvil. Small enough to fit on the muscle of your hand as Mashiach, who's a Melech, has to wear. And I'm going to leave the last Pasuk left. Mashiach himself should write his course. He should be his Sefer Torah. Every person should make sure to learn Tayag Mitzvah Satayra and learn Mitzvah Satayra. It's very, very important, especially now. You can't learn Erevin without Mamish getting into the Mitzvah. There's some very good Svarim that have come out recently. There's more that's necessary and many, many Chalakim of Torah. The Iker is we shouldn't just buy Svarim, but we should actually learn them and the Torah should become internalized within us, and we should be zeichet to be as great tzaddik b'mher b'yemino. Amen. Shame Egan Shiret Torah must have spoken like a big Asher Kach Rabbi Deutsch with a very inspiring and informative shir. Like a big Asher Kach to Mr. and Mrs. Hashi Oberland of a support to an Eid Shirli Lenishma Seishem Alka Basher Bavom Anshel Akoyen. Well, uh, Shalom, just that was today's Iron of. Okay, I have these swords here. If anybody gets to uh, blocks my view, uh, my blocks the camera. Um, okay. Okay, whoever like to uh, support the Egan Shiri Taira and uh, put an ad in the journal to help the Abbas's Taira of Egan Shiri Taira throughout the year and on uh, the regular upcoming uh, dinner of Egan Shiri Taira, can uh, call the Egan Shiri Taira at 718-851-8651 or email tapecenter at com. For this great schus. Kananya and Akash, Marotak, and his Borokul, Zakas, and Israel, the figure Hebel, and Tayo, Mitzvah, and Emma, and I hope it's a Mansukai Yagdo Terriade.